Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 4th of November. And this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 7th of November. And it's been yet another choppy week for global equity markets. We've seen further weakness in the US as some of the earnings numbers and guidance numbers continue to disappoint. We've seen the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England both raise interest rates by 75 basis points with very starkly different messages when it comes to guidance as to the future direction of those said rates. So what does that mean going forward? Well, certainly I think in terms of the Federal Reserve, it's quite clear that um, Jerome Powell is in no mood to pivot on monetary policy. And unsurprisingly, that has had a significant upward effect when it comes to US two-year Treasury yields, which have hit their highest levels since 2008, above 4.7%. However, if you contrast that with the messaging from the Bank of England, if we look at a UK gilt two-year uh, line chart, we can see that um, the messaging is somewhat different, even though um, the two-year gilt actually closed the day um, three basis points higher. Messaging from the Bank of England was starkly different in the context of the fact that while they matched the Federal Reserve's rate hike, what they didn't do was um, issue some particularly tough guidance. If anything, they were more concerned about um, the health of the housing market, mortgage rates. I was struck quite starkly by how much emphasis was placed on borrowing costs, particularly mortgage rates. And the, the governor's really pessimistic outlook when it came to the UK economy, all that was missing was Private Fraser from Dad's Army wandering around muttering, we're doomed uh, underneath his breath. So stark was the message that the governor was painting. And he was very keen to play down the prospect that rates were likely to rise anywhere near as much as the markets were pricing well, Mr. Governor, we don't believe you. And the reason we don't believe you is because of the other narrative that's taken hold this week is the narrative of a potential China reopening. Uh, and I think that's the real risk um, for equity markets, but also for inflation. You know, if you think inflation is bad now, what happens if the Chinese economy um, suddenly kickstarts into life as they look to come out of their zero? current zero COVID policy. Now, I think that is unlikely to happen in the short to medium term, but it's certainly the narrative, it's certainly a narrative that markets have got hold of. And, you know, in the absence of anything else, it's likely to be a narrative that could well underpin crude oil prices. If we look at crude oil prices so far over the course of the past few weeks, they have been trending higher. And anyone who's, you know, anyone who's has more than a passing interest in filling up their car will have noticed that um, uh, unleaded prices have started to edge higher again away from 162, 163 a litre up back towards 170. So there is a significant risk that um, the Bank of England's assessment about future inflation levels could be, well, as has been pretty much the case for the past 12 months, wide of the mark. Um, there, the Bank of England's uh, target for inflation this time next year is around about 5.6%. So around about half of where it currently is now at 10.1. Their end of year target for inflation here in the UK is 10.9%. So I think in essence, they've undermined their hawkish rate hike um, by basically uh, pushing the pound lower against the dollar, which ultimately is the last thing I think the pound needs at the moment. We have seen a bit of a rebound from yesterday's sell-off, 2% down on the day, over 2% down on the day, and over 3% down on the week. So that's certainly a worry going forward because certainly the exchange rate is one mechanism that has seen inflation here in the UK spike quite substantially over the course of the past 12 months and could well continue to do so if the Federal Reserve has its way. And that's why today's payrolls report is very, very important in the wider context of things. Now, I'm recording this around about 7.14, 7.13 in the morning um, before the payrolls report is published. Um, but we also have US CPI next week. And I think that's one of the key, I think that's one of the key 
economic indicators that we have when it comes to peak dollar hawkishness, how much higher can the dollar go? Certainly, I think if Jerome Powell has his way and the Fed has his way, they want to dampen down um, inflation expectations. Pushing the dollar higher is one way of doing that. And that's why headline inflation in the US has been trending lower over the course of the past few months, even as core prices are starting to edge higher. The problem is the US is exporting its inflation problem to the rest of the world. And that's, a, you know, that's not really a zero sum game. There will be consequences to that. And we're already seeing that play out in the European Union as well, where inflation is even higher. Headline inflation is even higher than here in the UK. So as we look ahead to next week and a potential further rate hikes in December from the Federal Reserve, we have been talking or the Fed has been talking about a step down in the pace of rate hikes from 75 basis points to 50 basis points. And certainly that was um, could be construed as potentially dovish. But what Powell went on to say was the fact that rate, th these rate hikes of 50 or 25 were likely to go on for much longer than markets were currently pricing. And that's why you saw the dollar um, rise as much as it did over the course of the past 24 to 48 hours. And, that, and, and therein lies the rub. If China reopens next year, then inflationary pressures aren't likely to subside particularly quickly. So all these central banks targeting much lower levels of inflation could be overestimating the fall when it comes to um, the direction of prices. And that is a key risk. That is a key risk when it comes to overall global demand. Higher prices will act as a break on demand. So the China story, the China reopening story is a double-edged sword. Certainly it could potentially be positive for the global economy in terms of the resumption of trade and the untangling of supply chains, but it would also drive prices higher as demand for natural gas and crude oil products goes up. So um, looking ahead to the key data items that I'm looking out for next week. We've got third quarter GDP out of the UK. We've got US CPI, and we've also got China trade for October. Now, the September China trade numbers were unexpectedly delayed, prompting concerns that the data was likely to paint a really ugly picture of the Chinese economy. While the numbers eventually came in slightly ahead of expectations, there's little doubt that they probably don't offer an accurate reflection of the problems facing the Chinese economy as COVID cases continue to surge as winter approaches. And that's, I think that's why an imminent reopening of the Chinese economy is unlikely this side of 2023. I think if it's going to happen, it will probably happen at the end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter, as the weather starts to warm up. But more importantly, I think once China gets on top of its vaccine program, because essentially a zero COVID policy just will not work um, when you have a COVID, a COVID virus, it's as easily as transmissible as this current Omicron wave. I got COVID three or four weeks ago and it knocked me sideways for a week. Um, and I wasn't the only one. So it is, as I say, it is very highly transmissible. And consequently, it's impractical to have a zero COVID policy um, indefinitely. And I think, you know, we could see that start to get relaxed sometime next year. So in terms of the um, October trade numbers, um, we could well find that um, there is a continued um, low level of imports. Consumer demand also continues to look challenging, even as industrial production continues to improve. So I think in terms of imports in September, we saw a modest increase of 0.3%, which was unchanged from August's 0.3%, while exports also rose 5.7%. So certainly in terms of exports, the picture is slightly better, um, given the fact that uh, we are heading into the fourth quarter and heading into the Thanksgiving period for the US economy, Christmas period as well, where demand generally does tend to pick up a little bit as we head towards the new year. But ultimately, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for the Chinese economy this side of 2023 to see any significant um, GDP growth, irrespective of what those numbers were or are telling us.
Um, but certainly in the context of what commodity prices are doing, we are, we are starting to see a slow grind higher in crude oil prices, and that is a worry going forward, even though we are still well off the highs of the summer. Um, gold has started to rebound off the lows on the back of a slightly weaker dollar today after these after the big bid that we saw last week last week yesterday even and actually if we look at gold there is some evidence that potentially we could be seeing a little bit of a short-term base so that's certainly worth looking at in the overall scheme of things but what is troubling is we could see a rebound back to this level here but i think to break the downtrend in gold we need to break through the 50-day moving average and push higher so keep an eye on gold because i think if that spikes higher that could spark a little bit of a bout of dollar weakness what could cause that dollar weakness well you know there are two factors a weak payrolls number today um, which seems unlikely given the tightness of the labor market but us cpi on the 10th of november next week if we get a softening in core and i think that's I think that's the key metric now that markets are looking at. If core prices start to show signs of not necessarily softening, but flattening out, peaking and what have you, that could actually prompt a little bit of softness in the US dollar and actually be positive for risk. And certainly it's been a mixed bag for equity markets this week. European equity markets have outperformed US equity markets, US equity markets and tech in particular is still under pressure. But look at the FTSE today. Um, that was the big rally that we saw yesterday in, on the back of the weaker pound um, and the Bank of England. And now we're seeing a push higher today on the back of these unsubstantiated reports that China is looking at a potential reopening strategy. Now, as I said previously, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon, but the market is picking it up and it's running with it. So it's certainly something that we do need to be aware of going forward. And it certainly keeps the, the trend or the range intact when it comes to um, uh, the FTSE 100. Now, this is an interesting chart, the DAX, because what we've seen here yesterday, we saw a bearish engulfing day. Um, and we are starting to see a little bit of a pullback as we head into the end of the week. I think the key thing for me is this moving average here. Um, this, this, let's just change that. So we've actually got the 200 day. That's our long-term moving average on the DAX. We've broken above this trend line here. We're finding a little bit of support around 13,000. We need to push back above the 200 day moving average to diminish um, the downside risk and mark a breakout um, from the downtrend that we've seen so far this year. It's very interesting to know that also we, we appear to run out of steam at around about 13,500 area, which also coincides with these peaks through here. So I think in terms of the DAX, keep an eye on that 13,500 area, it could be very, very key in the overall scheme of things. But at the moment, there does appear to be a bit of a bearish reversal on the on the, on the the Germany 40, so it's worth keeping an eye on. S&P 500, seen a bit of a rebound on that today, but that picture tells a story. Four successive days of declines, we're seeing a little bit of a rebound today. But overall, I think the dollar remains strong, and there are and there are, and there continue to be concerns about um, earnings numbers in the U.S. The U.S. is much more overvalued than any other market, so it still remains very much in the downtrend that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. So even if we do get a squeeze higher, the U.S. markets continue to be a play a, a sell rally type of play. Um, NASDAQ 100, that's obviously seen the biggest um, sell-off this week. Interesting to note, we haven't been able to take out that 10,500 area. So that's going to be very key going forward. 10,500 on the NASDAQ um, for signs of further weakness there. Um, Euro dollar, um, broken lower, this trend line here. We can now get rid of that line. It's no longer valid. Seen a bit of a bearish reversal here. We've trended lower. We're looking to retest the 97 area, which was the lows back on the 21st of October. But we've also got decent support at 96.30. We have 
broken slightly to the downside, but there still are multiple areas of support all the way back to the lows in September. And I think that's probably going to be the way of it. Choppy trading, retesting the lows, getting a rebound, retesting the lows, getting a rebound. You know, the big resistance level at the moment is obviously the rally that we saw um, just prior to the ECB meeting around about 101. So I think we need to get above 101 to signal a change of direction when it comes to euro dollar. So we talked about cable. That's been pretty ugly. Get rid of that line now. Don't need it anymore. This is the next key support level. It's 109, 11060, which was the lows on the 21st of October and the 10920 area and the October lows um, back here. So again, similar to euro dollar, what was interesting about this cable chart was we respected this downtrend line from the highs of earlier this year. As for euro sterling, that continues to chop quite significantly and probably will continue to do so. Interesting to note, we respected this uptrend line from here. Um, the next key resistance level for euro sterling is in and around these peaks around here, 87.80 there or thereabouts. Okay, so third quarter GDP out of the UK, not expected to be a pretty number. We did see our unexpected revision in second quarter GDP from minus 0.1 to 0.2. So we won't be in a technical recession, but nonetheless, for most people, it won't feel like that. The third quarter GDP number is not expected to be pretty. PMIs have been trending lower for months. In August and September, retail sales fell off a cliff, dropping by minus 1.7 and minus 1.4. And the recent monthly GDP numbers don't offer much help with July expanding by 0.1, while August saw a minus 0.3% contraction. September is unlikely to be better given the extra bank holiday for Queen Elizabeth II's funeral, which means we could see a contraction of up to 0.5%, minus 0.5%. But that won't be telling us anything that we don't already know because we're already feeling it. Um, got the US midterms on the 8th of November. Um, I don't expect that to have any significant impact on risk. Yeah, you've got Democrats complaining about the fact that the Fed's going too fast when it comes to rate hikes and the effect that it will have on the unemployment rate. But that's just standard political noise and political posturing playing to their base. Nonetheless, um, I think if anything, it's probably just going to mean the, the outcome is just going to mean more gridlock in Congress, more gridlock at the top of the US body politic. In terms of earnings numbers, we've got a lot of retail coming out, um, a bit of a mixed bag this week, but we've got Associated British Foods that continues to underperform, aka Primark does appear to have found a bit of a base. Sainsbury's numbers earlier this week or um, earlier this month were actually better than expected and the shares saw a fairly decent pop from um, the lows. Of, well, they've already seen a fairly decent pop off the record lows that we saw back in October. And I think you could, uh, you could actually argue that potentially um, there's too much pessimism priced in to the ABF, the Associated British Foods share price as well. It's Primark business has been doing fairly decent business since it reopened after the pandemic. Um, sales rose to £3.54 billion pounds with the UK um, business driving the recovery. In Q3, the, the numbers showed the worst was behind it. Group revenues rose to over £4 billion. Pounds. Primark business saw an 18% rise, 81% rise even. My notes are wrong. I'm not dyslexic, honest. Um, yeah, seeing an 81% rise to 1.73%, which is hugely encouraging. So the, set, the revenues are comfortably above pre-pandemic levels and total revenue is up 29% on a nine-month basis. So even if you have a disappointing fourth quarter, um, the numbers still look fairly decent. Um, obviously, costs have gone up by £200 million, but the grocery business is expected to grow its revenues as well as its sugar and agricultural businesses. So th there's certainly scope for potentially that to go high. We've also got Marks and Spencers as well, which again has also seen significant weaknesses. And, you know, and, and again here, we appear to have found a little bit of a base in and around October. 
So um, with with pre-Christmas um, period coming up, there is certainly potential for further gains. Having said that, um, to get the gains that we've seen thus far have been fairly muted in nature. And um, I think when you actually look at where the share price was at the beginning of this year, where it is now, you know, you're talking you're talking a decline of a significant significant how much you know how much of it is already priced in let's look at let's look at the decline thus far it's 52 percent year to date down the share price so there's an awful lot of pessimism baked in already when it comes to marks and spencers so that's worth keeping an eye out for that's those numbers are out on the 9th of november we've got halion halion however you want to call it the business spun out of Glaxo Smith Klein, the, the 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 consumer business, that's really underperformed at the moment, um, falling from its IPO price of 330p, and there is an awful lot of concern about the the amount of debt that particular business is carrying, hence the sell-off, and also concerns about litigation as a result of I think it's a Zantac um, product, um, which is a uh, which was, I think, some sort of painkiller. So it'd be interesting to see the numbers for that. Again, that those numbers are out on the 10th, third quarter numbers. Then we have got Disney. These numbers should be interesting in the context of the overall streaming narrative. They have taken a dive in the past couple of days because Shanghai's Disneyland Resort has been closed indefinitely. So there could be a hit to revenues there. Um, growth in Disney Plus subscriber numbers continued in this third quarter numbers with a rise from 137.7 million to 152.1 it's also company also said it would be raising prices to 11 dollars a month for its us audience but most of the new subscribers in q3 came from its hot star service in india which they are selling at a very discounted price so certainly very much a loss leader nonetheless the various boosts from the Parks and Studios business helped to boost its Q3 revenues to $21.5 billion. Um, Q4 is probably going to be a slightly different story, and certainly Q1 is probably going to be revised down because of the loss of revenue from the China business because of the shutdown, the indefinite shutdown there. Also got Rivian, and um, be interesting to see whether or not it's still on course or whether they think that they will be able to deliver on their um, one-year target of delivering 25,000 cars for the whole year. They still remain well short of that. They have challenges facing production and sourcing raw materials, but they do appear, the shares do appear to have found a little bit of a base chopping around between 28 and $40. So those numbers are out again on the 9th of November, third quarter numbers for Rivian. Last but not least, AMC Entertainment. Given the woes of Cineworld, we can see that this once meme stock has settled down pretty much where it deserves to be, which is very, very cheap indeed. Certainly with the summer blockbuster scene behind it, um, AMC share price has slipped below the waves again, hitting an 18-month low. Um, which also came in the aftermath of the management taking the decision to declare a special preferred stock dividend, which essentially is a stock split. So there's now two AMC Entertainment Holding shares. There's the preferred shares and there are these shares. They did have a good summer. Ticket sales more than doubled um, from a year ago. As the likes of Top Gun Maverick, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness got punters through the door. In July, the company said it had the highest monthly attendance in US theatres since December 2019. So certainly in terms of footfall, its US business is doing okay. Having said that, um, they did warn that the third quarter was probably likely to be very, very difficult to replicate the performance in the second quarter. And hopefully the key here will be about guidance going forward. So that's pretty much it for uh this week ladies and gentlemen as i say once again thank you very much for listening as i say we don't know the results of the payrolls numbers quite yet but expectations were for 
190,000 new jobs to be added in October. The unemployment rates come in at 3.6% and wage growth to slip to 4.7%. None of that is particularly dollar positive, but if we get a miss on the headline number, we get weakness in the wages or we see something a significant rise in the unemployment rate, that could be enough to take some of the edge of the recent dollar rally. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.